a Grammy Award winner with 30 million records sold and a new Broadway musical based on those records. The Heart of Rock and Roll opens at the James Earl Jones Theater in New York on March 29th. Please welcome Huey Lewis. <laughs> Huey, you brought a little device along so that uh, you can hear me because you have hearing issues. As, exactly. As those who follow your work know. How are you? Can you am I all right? Like, yeah, I'm, good? I, I'm okay except okay. for my hearing, yeah. Because I notice sometimes when we have dinner together and stuff, I'll say something, you'll pretend you heard me. True. Yes, yeah. and like that. Like, like now. Like now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to shout at you for this, uh, the rest of this interview so it's very clear. Who would have guessed that in the year 2024, we would have not one, but two Broadway musicals featuring the music of Huey Lewis and the News. It's pretty crazy. I mean, besides me. <laughs> I, I, I apologize. Yeah. I, I don't, you know. Uh, of course, uh, there's Back to the Future, which is very popular, and right. now you have The Heart of Rock and Roll opening at the end of the month. Whose right. idea was the musical? Uh, it was actually my... Uh, my neighbor's son-in-law, Tyler Mitchell, our co-producer, it was his idea, and it was suggested by his father-in-law, which was who's my neighbor. Now, can I be honest? When you told me this, you told me about this, and you said, "Yeah, we're working on a musical," and I said, "Oh, uh, well, how you know how did this come to be?" And you said, "Yeah, my neighbor's son-in-law had an idea." I was like, "Oh, yeah, that's not going to happen." Did <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> nothing involving a neighbor's son-in-law yeah. ever comes to? Well, 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 the neighbor's son-in-law is Tyler Mitchell, and he works for Imagine Entertainment. Yeah, and uh, Brian Grazer and Ron Howard, and he knows what he's doing. And, yeah, well, yeah, and, and he did a good job. It's a good neighborhood, I it's guess. It's a good neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, you. Uh, I went to see the show in San Diego. Right. How long ago did you guys put it up? Like four years, maybe? And it was getting ready to go to Broadway, and then COVID hit, exactly. obviously, and it slowed it down. How, for those who saw it in San Diego, how much different is it from that production? Well, significantly, actually. There's probably four, four new songs and uh, some different scenes, and, yeah, it's, it's changed a little bit. It, are there songs that you expected would be in the musical that they decided not to put in the musical? Yes. Which ones? Um, Some of My Lies Are True. Uh-huh. Heart and Soul uh -huh. is not in the show. Oh. Uh, While We're Young from our new album, which was in the show, and they took it out because it wasn't fast enough, I guess. Huh. And when they change the lyrics, because I know they change some of the lyrics right. for, to work with the musical, do they have to check with you first to make sure it's okay to change the lyrics? Yes. Yes, they do. <laughs> and are you always okay with the changes that they've made in the lyrics? Mostly. Uh-huh. Because you, had, you have a radio show on Apple Music. True. And um, you and my cousin Sal had a long talk about my cousin Sal and I had a big fight. It's right. another one of my fights. Um, <laughs> when we were teenagers about um, the song, If This Is if It. If This Is It. And he thought the lyrics were, do you remember what he thought it was? Um, you'll do anything to avoid a butterfly. No, no, you, it's, you'll say anything to avoid a fight are the real lyrics. Right. He thought it was, you'll say anything to a butterfly. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, like if they were to pitch actually, that. Actually, actually, I kind of like that. Yeah, that's I, not bad. I, I, Could be your next Broadway yeah. musical. <laughs> the misheard lyrics of Huey Lewis and the News. <laughs> So um, you were also the, I thought, the, like, underdog hero of that documentary on Netflix, The Greatest yeah. Night in Pop. I mean, that was like, I think, it was. I remember sitting next to you at the premiere. Right. And you remember this? And, you, like, everyone was clapping for you. And, and I go, stand up, yeah. stand up. And you're like. What? I'm like, are you gonna stand up? Because you couldn't hear. But people were laughing at like your. You were so nervous in during the, sh the making of that film of that movie. Uh, what was it? A song, right? Yeah, it was a song. That's right. It was a song, <laughs> but also a movie. Yes. And then, um, and you were nervous and kind of adorably so. But the reason you were nervous was because they didn't tell you you had a solo, right? Right. Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie did not fully inform you of what was going on. Exactly. And, we, and, and, I, and I wasn't just nervous, I was petrified. Uh, yeah. 
Not as petrified as Bob Dylan was, though. Oh, true. <laughs> he looked like he was gonna die. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's a pretty tough room, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, you know, I have a solo line, and then, then Quincy says, uh, Huey, why don't you join, you guys join, and now Cindy Lauper and Kim Carnes and I have to figure out a harmony part in front of the best singers in the world. You yeah. Know? And uh, so it was, it was. I think we have, do we have the clip of that? Yeah, let's take a look at that. But then they said, sing in harmony with Cindy and Kim. The demo didn't have any harmony parts or anything. I'm gonna have to make something up here, make up a three-part harmony in front of Stevie Wonder, Ray Charles, Kenny Loggins, Daryl Hall. <laughs> what am I supposed to sing? That was very nerve-wracking. <laughs> yeah, that was, I would imagine that would be nerve-wracking. But Bob Dylan, again, appeared to be in hell. <laughs> you told me something that I cannot get over, and I think about it every so often, in the 80s, during the heyday of your band, Bob Dylan wrote a song for you guys. He did. He sent you, what, a cassette? He sent me a cassette and a lovely note saying he liked the last record and here's a song of mine. And, and, for, and, and not only did I not cut it, I don't actually know where the cassette is. You it's, lost the cassette. It, yeah, well, no, it's, it's, it's part of my cassette collection <laughs> when there's thousands of cassettes there. So, uh, you know... I could probably find it eventually. Yeah, yeah. So why didn't you record Bob Dylan's song that he wrote for you? I have no idea. It was a, <laughs> it was a big mistake. Yeah. What can I say? I'm sorry. Was there a meeting with the band where you got where you said, "Hey, Bob Dylan wrote a song for us"? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think I probably played it for them. Um, I can't remember to be honest, but uh, it was a mistake. Do you think? Uh, no, note to self: when Bob Dylan sends you a song. Record it. Record it, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you put it in the musical. Tack it on in the end. How did you start playing harmonica? And why did you start playing harmonica? Well, um, there was a, my, when my parents split up, my mother was a, was a hippie, to be honest. She was like one of the very first hippies in San Francisco. And she rented a room to a boarder who was a folk singer called Billy Roberts, who wrote Hey Joe, incidentally. And he Jimmy Hendrix was, recording. He yeah. is a folk singer, and he played harmonicas with the, the little bridge thing. Mm -hmm. And he gave me all his old harmonicas. And I uh, then I was like 60, and I graduated a year young from high school. And my dad said, uh, "I only want you. You, you can do whatever you want to do in life, but there's one more thing I'm going to make you do. What's that? Don't go to college. Not yet." He says, "I want you to bum around Europe." And, and so I all right. And I took the harmonica because it kind of fit the image. And my mom said. That's the first good idea your old man ever had. And, and gave me a Bob Dylan record and said, the poets love this guy. Check him out. Wow. And uh, that was my and first. And little did she know, years later, you go on to reject him. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. it, it, was, it was just a song. It wasn't Bob. It was a song. Who blew your mind when you were, um, like, coming up and, like, listening to records? What were the records that really made you go, this is what I want to do? Uh, soul music, for the most part. I was a, I was a, a black music snob. I liked uh, stack stuff. I mean, you know, Ray Charles, uh, you know, Johnny Taylor, uh, Sam, Sam Moore. Yeah. That, that kind of stuff. And um, so then it must have been crazy to be but, with but, Ray Charles but, but, in that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I couldn't introduce myself to Ray Charles. I was so nervous. I couldn't do it. I, you know, I, just, I sort of followed him around, you know, and watched him. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was nerve wracking. But you know, when I joined my first um, college band, um, we, we played sort of the, what, the top 40 of the day or the FM 40. So I found that although I preferred to listen to certain types of music, all music was fun to play. Uh -huh. And so that I became much less of a snob and uh, learned to appreciate all kinds of music. Is it true that punk rock music is what inspired you to be this elite singer? In a way, it wasn't so much the music. You know, I was in a band called Clover and we were in London and we, the day we landed, uh, really, you know, punk music hit. I mean, uh, Johnny Rotten spit in the face of the first NME reporter, and the game was on. We went to, uh, I remember our first week there, 
we went to the Clash's first gig at the Roundhouse. Wow. And imagine, we're like a California country band. We're at the Roundhouse, which is in the round. And I'm on the side. Uh, and the spotlight is on Strummer. And he's leaning out over the, cr over the crowd. And he's glistening in saliva. They're <laughs> spitting on him. And he's spitting on him back. And the, it's... And, and you said, I want to do that. And I'm going, <laughs> what did I get myself in for? <laughs> no. Well, but listen. I, yeah, go ahead. The, but the, the inspiration for me from the punks was go for, with our, our old band, we kept grooming ourselves for record companies and listening to what the business told us we should do. And the punks were thumbing their nose at the music business and just singing their own quirky songs their own quirky way. And I thought, wow, how liberating. And I vowed that if my band ever broke up, that's what I'd do. Go back to my hometown, surround myself with my favorite musicians, and don't listen to anybody. Just play our own stuff, you know. And, and that's what we did. There you go. Huey Lewis, everybody. His musical, The Heart of Rock and Roll, opens at the James Earl Jones Theater on March 29th. No spitting, please, right? No spitting at the show? No, no spitting. All right, we'll be back to hear a song from that musical with Mackenzie Kurtz.